Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Bloomsbury House. Um, I'm glad you made it here rather than going to Arundel House. We are, are currently renovating our fifth floor, which is why we have the opportunity and actually the privilege to come to this rather wonderful building. Um, it's just over a year now since US forces left Iraq and the country fully recovered its sovereignty. In the 12 months since then, Syria and, Iraq, Syria and Iran have really displaced Iraq in the headlines. However, in the region that continues to command our attention, uh, US pivot to Asia notwithstanding, Iraq still looms large by dint of its uh, location, its uh, size, geography, location, population, uh, its demographic mix, to say nothing, of course, of its oil. Uh, it remains a pivotal state in the region. Our author today, uh, Dr. Toby Dodge, has been Senior Consulting Fellow at the IISS since 2003. He's Reader in International Relations at the LSE. He has a PhD in Iraqi politics, and in 2007-2008, he worked for General Petraeus in Baghdad as an advisor on Iraqi politics. This is actually his third Adelphi book. His first Adelphi, Iraq at the Crossroads, was published in January 2003, on the eve of the invasion, and predicted the rise of the insurgency. His second book, Iraq's Future, The Aftermath of Regime Change, published in July 2005, predicted the descent into the civil war. From his, the title of his latest Adelphi, you can get a sense of where he thinks that the uh, country is headed now. But for the details, I'll hand over to him. Toby. All right. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you for all coming on what is a ferociously cold winter's afternoon. And it's already been pointed out to me from the front row. As I, as I look out uh, at the audience, I see people who have... Um, Iraqis and non-Iraqis who've lived the last 10 years, uh, or lived the last uh, nearly 13 years since the invasion, um, and some of whom I've insulted in print, some of whom I have yet to. So uh, I look forward to a, well, they haven't read the book yet, I look forward to a great uh, discussion afterwards. I think it's especially apt that this latest book, Iraq from War to a New Authoritarianism, should be published by the IISS and then its launch chaired by Nicholas Redmond. I've been a senior fellow at the IISS since 2003, and I've spent the vast majority of my time at the Institute seeking to understand what's going on in Iraq, struggling to kind of impose some kind of order, analytical order, on the unfolding of the violence. The Institute was kind enough to facilitate my research trips to Iraq um, in 2003, in 2007, and 2008. And I think especially today, most importantly, Nick has proved to be both a skilled but also very diplomatic editor of the book we're going to discuss this evening. So I've, as I've said, the, the book represents my attempt at understanding the unfolding of Iraqi politics since 2003, and a great chunk of it is focused on what drove Iraq into civil war, say from around 2004 onwards. And I've identified three drivers of the violence that have killed so many ordinary innocent Iraqis. The first is undoubtedly the sectarian politics. And those Iraqi analysts amongst us will remember fondly or otherwise the huge debates that uh, Iraqis had and Iraqi analysts had about the role of sectarian politics. I'd certainly identify what we could call a series of ethnic entrepreneurs, formerly exiled politicians who came back to Iraq after 2003 and specifically and overtly used religious and sectarian identity, religious and ethnic identity, to mobilize the population, especially in those two elections in 2005. Now, the second driver of Iraq's descent into civil war was the collapse of the Iraqi state in the aftermath of the invasion. Now, this isn't only the infamous disbanding of the Iraqi army and its intelligence services. This isn't only the driving out of the senior ranks of the Ba'ath Party from the civil service from government employment. This is actually the dismembering of the state. 18 of the central Iraqi um, government buildings were stripped in Baghdad when I was there in 2003. So much scrap metal was stolen from government buildings that the scrap metal price in Turkey and Iraq, in Iran, its neighbors dropped as the ill-gotten gains of the looters were shipped out of the country. But thirdly, the big issue that drove Iraq into, into civil war was the political system set up after 2003. I've gone into that in quite a lot of detail, and I've labeled it, much to the horror of my editor, an exclusive elite pact, which basically meant that those Iraq, former Iraqi exiles empowered by the United States then set up a political system that deliberately excluded a great deal of indigenous 
politicians, but anyone associated, thought to be associated with the previous regime in a kind of blanket attempt to remake Iraqi politics. Now, the conclusions of the books are broadly sobering and pessimistic, that certainly the exclusive elite pact has not been reformed in spite of Iraqis' electoral victory in the 2010 elections that sectarian politics, the sectarian rhetoric that, that mobilized Iraqi politics from 2003 until 2010 has come back into, the, into fashion with the prime minister himself using coded sectarian language to seek to solidify his electoral base amongst Iraqi Shias. But it's, it's it, it, and, and basically the only thing that has been rebuilt since 2003 are, are Iraq's military, and they now employ 930,000 people, which is equal to 8% of the country's entire workforce, or 12% of the population of adult males. However, running parallel to that, the civilian capacity of the Iraqi state is still woefully inadequate. In 2011, the United Nations estimated that only 26% of the population were covered by the public sewage network. That leaves 83% of the country's wastewater untreated. 25% of the population has no access to clean running water. And the Iraqi Knowledge Network in 2011 estimated that an average Iraqi household only gets seven and a half hours of electricity a day. Now, in the middle of the winter, that might not seem like a big issue. But in the burning hot heat of Basra in the summer, or indeed in Baghdad, Iraq has suffered a series of heat waves over the last few years, not getting el enough electricity to make your fan or air conditioning work means that you're in a living hell. This is in spite of the fact that the Iraqi and US governments have collectively spent $200 billion seeking to rebuild the Iraqi state. So I think that, that the conclusions of the Adelphi are rather pessimistic. The Iraqi state its coercive arm has been rebuilt, but precious little beside that has. But what I want to do is look at this afternoon, is look at the ramifications of that rather slewed rebuilding, a large, powerful army and a weak uh, civil institutions of the state. And I thought I might exemplify this by examining a single significant event that occurred on, thir on the afternoon of Thursday, the 20th of December, 2012. That afternoon, government security forces raided the house of Iraq's Minister of Finance, Dr. Rafi al Isawi. Isawi is a leading member of the Iraqi coalition that in 2010 won a slim majority of seats in the Iraqi parliament, 91 to 89, on a 62% turnout. Now, the, 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 the ramifications of attempting to arrest Isawi and indeed arresting a number of his bodyguards and um, pr prosecuting his chief bodyguard for alleged terrorist offences cannot be overstated. In the aftermath of the elections, there were a series of tortured, fractured, very um, bad-tempered negotiations which <laughs> finally resulted in the creation of another government of national unity and much more importantly led Nuri, Nuri al-Maliki, the Prime Minister since 2006, to retain the office of the Prime Ministership. Isawi, as Minister of Finance, is probably the most important, the most powerful Iraqi politician to gain office in the country. He won plaudits in his professional handling, handling of the Ministry of Finance and attempted to push himself above the political fray, not to uh, engage in the rather knockabout and aggressive political rhetoric that has come to define Iraqi politics. So in arresting or in seeking the arrest of Asawi, in charging him with offences of terrorism, clearly what Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki is doing is throwing down a gauntlet, attempting to seize further power and bring, him, bring, it, to, uh, br bring it into the office of the Prime Minister. Isawi, when his house was raided, rang the Prime Minister to ask him who had authorised it, a call the Prime Minister refused to take. He then fled seeking sanctuary in the house of the Speaker of Parliament, a fellow Iraqi politician, Osama al-Najafi. He then held a press conference when he said, and this is a politician not prone to wild rhetoric, not prone 
to political populism. He said, Maliki, quote, Maliki now wants to just get rid of his partners, to build a dictatorship. He wants to consolidate power more and more. Now, if this wasn't so disturbing, the, the attack on Asawa's house triggers memories of a very similar event almost 12 months before, on the same day that the final Ara American troops left Iraq in December 2011. Um, uh, Iraqi security forces led by the Prime Minister's son laid siege to Vice President Tariq al-Hashimi's house. Hashimi was subsequently allowed to leave to the Kurdish regional government's capital of Erbil, but a number of his bodyguards are arrested. Two of them were tortured to death and, before, and, and the rest of them were paraded on television where they confessed to activities of terrorism. So basically, now let me turn to explain what the raid on Asawi's house in December of 2012 is representative of, what I've called in the book the rise of a new authoritarianism. And this authoritarianism has been driven forward by Nouri al-Maliki, who was first appointed prime minister in the early months of 2006. Now, quite fascinatingly, why Nouri al-Maliki was appointed was at the time he was seen as a grey politician. He was... Um, the second in command of the Islamic Dawa Party, a party that was seeking to maximize the vote of Iraq's Shia, Shia population, but a party that had no internal militia. It had no um, uh, military force of its own. So it's seen by the competing fractured ruling elite of Iraq as not posing a threat. Now, upon taking office in April 2006, Maliki was confronted by the very issue that had given rise to his appointment, his inability to govern. Under the Iraqi system in 2006, the office of the prime minister was seen as a, cons uh, as a consensus vehicle. Maliki was sought to negotiate between the US ambassador, the, head of, the American head of uh, multinational co the coalition, and other Iraqi politicians. He wasn't seen as a first among equals. What Maliki has done since 2006 is, is successfully create power in his own hands. He first seized control of the Islamic Dawah Party, his own party, and then he built up a small and cohesive group of functionaries called in Iraq the Malikayoun, a group of people, friends, faction followers, but also his family, his son, his nephew, and his son-in-law, and he's placed them in key points across the Iraqi state, seeking to circumvent the cabinet, the official uh, vestibule of power in the Iraqi state, and seize control of Iraq's institutions. And I think he's very successfully managed to do this, primarily because his political rivals were more intent until at least 2010 on fighting amongst themselves than they were on seeking to constrain his power. What in Maliki's done is effect to set up a shadow state. He's, put, he's anchored power into the office of the Prime Minister and appointed his son, Ahmed uh, Maliki, Deputy Chief of Staff, giving him a, an oversight role on his father's own security, but an oversight role across also the security, or, uh, the security services of the whole of Iraq. We can see a major watershed moment in um, 2007 when Maliki launches uh, the, the in, sorry, in March 2008, when Maliki launches the charge of the night, sends a series of Iraqi army battalions down to Basra to seize control of Basra, but also to outflank what he thought was a conspiracy against him with uh, Muqtada al-Sadr's militia fomenting the instability in Basra, triggering a vote of no confidence in the parliament and forcing, Maliki to remo uh, for forcing Maliki's removal. Maliki, by sending his uh, military forces down to Basra, circumvents that and rides a wave of popular appreciation that he's seen as the man who's saving Iraq from civil war, the man who's imposing order on the Iraqi population. He then um, sets up a, 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 an electoral coalition, the state of law, that seeks to maximize his credentials as a strong man, as a man delivering law and order, but also, ironically, as an Iraqi nationalist who's seeking to rebuild the state and deliver what the population want in the aftermath 
of the Civil War, stability and predictability. Now, he takes the state of law platform into the, 2000, the March 2010 national elections, but then faces an extended and very coherent challenge from another coalition, Iraqia, led by Ayad Alawi, both seeking, to, po uh, per both seeking to, to, to claim to be Iraqi nationalists, both seeking to build a coalition um, across the sectarian divide. Now, as we know, Iraqia won 91 seats, and Maliki won 89. In the period following the vote, Maliki's behavior became increasingly authoritarian as he faced electoral defeat. No way will we accept these results, he bluntly stated, demanding a recount in order to prevent, quote, a return to violence. The potentially sinister implications of this statement in the aftermath of the election was that Maliki issued it overtly in his role as the head of the country's armed forces. Now, there was then a stalemate from March 2010 to November 2010 as the different electoral coalitions argued amongst themselves about how to break out of the impasse. This, Im this impasse was caused firstly by Iraqia's electoral victory, the mobilization of the population above Baghdad, across the northwest between Baghdad and the Kurdish regional government, the turnout of a broadly Sunni vote mobilized in terms of Iraqi nationalism was a direct threat to the political system set up after 2003. However, what also counterbalanced this fear and seized up negotiations was a dawning realization amongst Iraq's ruling elite that Nouri al-Maliki had very successfully, in the four years since he was appointed, centralized power in his own hands and in the hands of his functionaries, the Maliki Yun. In the end, there was a breakthrough in November 2010, a new national government and a series of agreements that sought to limit the power of Nouri al-Maliki, that he wasn't allowed to appoint an ally to the Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of Interior, and there was meant to be a greater strategic council through which policy, especially security policy, would be made by consensus. Maliki, since November 2010, has abrogated each one of those attempts to limit his power. He has indeed refused a series of proposed ministers of interior and ministers of defense. He's put instead in both of those offices weak people tied to himself and then appointed a very close friend to the minister, Ministry of National Security. In fact, you could argue after losing the March 2010 elections, by concentrating power, by abrogating the Ibil Agreement, Nouri al-Maliki is more powerful today than at any time since 2006. In addition, Maliki has deployed an increasingly powerful judiciary to weaken the existing institutional oversights on his power. In January 2011, Chief, uh, Chief Justice uh, Mahmoud uh, ruled that a series of previously independent and powerful agencies set up by the US occupation to oversee the Iraqi state, the Committee of Integrity, the Independent High Electoral Commission, the Central Bank of Iraq, and the High Commission for Human Rights would now be subject to direct cabinet oversight. In effect, giving oversight <coughs> to the most coherent politician in the cabinet, Nouri al-Maliki himself. In October 2010, I think in a foreshadowing of the, movement, uh, the move against Asawi, the Ministry of Finance, the respected head of the central bank, Sinan al-Shabibi, and his deputy were indicted on corruption charges and sacked. Al-Shabibi, uh, unsurprisingly, was out of the country at the time and hasn't been allowed to, to re-enter the, uh, the country either he, uh, unless he would be, uh, face an um, arrest. And then in April 2012, the head of the Independent High Electoral Committee, the very man that Nouri al-Maliki blamed for his electoral defeat, was arrested and held in jail for three days on a series of petty corruption charges um, involving uh, in under a well under $1,000. On the second day in jail, this man was rung up on his mobile phone by no one, no one else but the Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, who said, oh, your arrest has got nothing to do with me. I'll see if we can get you out as soon as possible. And a clear attempt to link that man's freedom to his uh, ability to, to, to Nouri al-Maliki in Nouri al-Maliki's gift. Now, if the, if the centralizing of power 
uh, in terms of the civil, civil institutions of the state wasn't worrying enough, Maliki has very successfully taken both the army and the intelligence services and brought them under the control of, the office, of, of his own prime minister's office. Um, the office of the commander-in-chief was set up in 2007 as a coordinating body to bring together the police, the army, and the intelligence services. Maliki quickly realized its potential, expanded its staff, and brought it into his own office. He's, he's basically directly undermined the chain of command that should link the Minister of Defense through, the command, through his commanders to battalion heads, now directly issuing orders to battalion heads through use of their mobile phone. Then in February 2007, again in, in, um, with the agreement of the United States as part of the surge, something called the Baghdad Operation Command was sent, set up to consolidate uh, the forces sent into Baghdad and to give them more coherence. Maliki took that model and set up a series of provincial command centers at, at, in areas across Iraq where there was violence or instability. This means one general now has responsibility for commanding both the army and the police force. And unsurprisingly, those generals are appointed by a central office in command in, ba in Baghdad, ra uh, ruled by Nuri al-Maliki. So what Maliki has very effectively done is broken the chain of command, ironically coup-proofing the army, fracturing the army so it has no esprit de corps, has no collective interest, and then tied key generals in strategic areas across the country to his power, to his personal rule, making their continued service depended, dependent on him as a gift. Finally, the Iraqi Special Operations Forces, roughly about 4,500 soldiers trained by the United States, considered to be one of the most effective military forces in the Middle East, was handed back in April 2007 to Iraqi control. The Prime Minister then set up a counter-terrorism bureau to run that force, brought them within the remit of the Prime Minister's office, and has used that force, the most effective military force in the country, as his striking tool. In Iraqi popular parlance, they're called the Fedain al-Maliki, as an ironic reference to the Fedain Saddam that Saddam used to use as his dirty force, but also as an as, as, as a indication of the fear this force is regarded with by Iraqi popular opinion. And Maliki has done something very similar to the Iraqi intelligence services, removing key people who were placed, trained and placed by uh, the United States, then purging mid-level functionaries within the intelligence service and replacing them with Dawa party functionaries or people tied directly to himself. Now, I think that, that I th un unquestionably makes the case for, a, for the title, a move out of out-and-out out civil war towards a consolidation of power in the hands of Nuri al-Maliki towards a new authoritarianism. How did this happen? Why has an invasion launched in 2003 specifically to remove um, a, a, a violent dictator led to something preciously close or heading towards a new authoritarianism? I think firstly, and unsurprisingly, when confronted with a powerful insurgency and then a civil war, the United States, after 2003, set up the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq, Mint Sticky, to build very quickly, reconstitute an Iraqi army. So, as George Bush said, as Iraqis stand up, the United States will stand down. Now, effectively, this has been a very efficient vehicle for rebuilding the Iraqi army. The Ministry of Defense's budget grew annually by 28% from 2005 to 2009. As I stated at the beginning, Iraq now has a huge armed forces. But on the other side, it has a series of very weak civil institutions. And if we look at the comparative history of post-colonial states, especially in the Middle East, the great, the, the great defenders of democracy civil society and the population will stand forward and stop the military or politicians abrogating democracy primarily 
when they can see the benefits of the civil institutions of the state delivering services that they need for their own survival. As I said at the beginning of the lecture, civil institutions are incredibly weak. The fact that only seven and a half hours of electricity can be delivered on average to Iraqi households is in spite of the fact that electricity production was targeted by the United States and then the Iraqi government as the prime vehicle for proving that the state was being rebuilt. Billions of dollars were spent on seeking to reconstitute the Iraqi state's capacity to deliver electricity, and that has failed. Again, if you look into Iraqi civil society, you see a society shredded, fractured by a civil war that raged from 2005 to at least 2008. That it is a very brave political activist that will stick her or, head, her or his head above the parapet and mobilize in a society, especially in Baghdad, until very recently dominated by death squads and sectarian militias. And then secondly, of course, that civil society was expressly and purposely divided along sectarian lines in a way to maximize the sectarian vote in the elections of 2000, and, in the two elections of 2005. Now beyond that, beyond the strong military arm of the state, the weak civilian arm of the state, and the fractured nature of Iraqi society, we have undoubtedly a, almost a perfect model of a rentier state. Now, ironically, after the state collapsed and oil exports dropped away, the renter, the source of renter economy, the, of renter funding, was actually delivered by the United States, by American taxpayers, in congressionally approved money being pumped into the Iraqi government. Now, the, uh, Iraq has seen its own government budget increase by $24 billion, increased from $24 billion in 2005 to $100 billion in 2012. By 2005 alone, the number of people employed by the Iraqi state was broadly comparable to that in 2003 before regime change. So what we have in Iraq today is a state with a massive and coherent coercive arm very effectively controlled by Nouri al-Maliki, a very weak civilian arm which isn't delivering the services that the population need and the services that the population would then generate respect towards the state if they were being delivered, a fractured ruling elite which has effectively been outflanked by Nouri al-Maliki as he's brought power into the office of the Prime Minister and indeed a population that is alienated and anger, angry at its ruling elite but cannot mobilize to replace them or reform the state. Now, the raid on Isawi's house triggered large demonstrations across the northwest of Iraq in December. In Ramadi, 100,000 people came onto the streets, and in Fallujah, 60,000 people. Fallujah where, is where Isawi's from. Participated in blocking the highway from Baghdad to Syria and Jordan. Isawi himself made a speech in Ramadi to, uh, to denounce... Uh, the arrest of his security guards and the politicization of the judiciary and Maliki's corruption. However, does this mean that Iraq is returning to civil war? I think the one faintly optimistic conclusion of the book is no. I think the rapid reconstitution of the Iraqi military has left the Iraqi state as the most powerful deployer of violence on the streets of all of South and Central Iraq. It has the capacity to keep a broad, rough and ready control on its own population. However, the 2.8, the two, uh, nearly 3 million people who voted for Iraq here in March 2010 have clearly seen their votes squandered, their key politicians driven from power by charges of corruption or by charges of terrorism. And this militancy has clearly stoked uh, the membership of al-Qaeda in Iraq, thought to be around 1,000 in 2011 and about 3,000 in October 2012. But when we look at where political violence is centered, it's in five provinces, Baghdad, Salahuddin, Diyala, Anbar, and Nineveh. And within those five provinces, it's in Mosul, in Nineveh, Baghdad, Bakuba and Diyala, and Fallujah and Ramadi and Anbar. Now, because Mosul and Baghdad are the two largest cities in Iraq, that does mean 
that politically motivated violence is still a major presence in ordinary Iraqis' lives, but it doesn't mean that that political violence is widespread enough or um, extensive enough to destabilize Iraq. I would leave you, I think, with the fact that Iraq is heading towards a new authoritarianism. And the cost of that new authoritarianism is shocking. By the time US troops left Iraq in December 2011, 4,500 American military personnel had died in the country. Iraq body count conservatively estimates that between 110 and 130,000 ordinary innocent Iraqis had been killed. And that the United States has spent over $200 billion reconstructing Iraq, only to deliver it back to this new form of rough and ready authoritarianism. This must raise profound questions. Thousands of civilians killed, billions of dollars expended, but an Iraq that doesn't, that an Iraq, an Iraqi state whose relationship with its population doesn't look so different to pre-2003, a highly corrupt elite remaining in power mainly through the coercive capacity of its own state. Now, you could say certainly there have been three national elections where a majority of the population has turned out. There has been a complete transformation of the Iraqi ruling elite. But that Iraqi ruling elite, and especially its prime minister, to my reading of the situation at least, doesn't, show to have, it doesn't seem to have any great commitment to the continued democratization of Iraq or indeed transparent and good governance. Um, a decade after the Ba'ath Party were removed, and a violent civil war was started. Thank you very much. Toby, uh, thank you very much um, for an excellent presentation, a series of fairly ominous conclusions, but ones that are very well <clears throat> supported by the evidence. Before I turn to questions, I actually invite those who are standing to come and sit down. There is, there is space at the front. Um, and to tell everyone that we will uh, we invite you to stay on uh, after the Q&A session. We will be serving wine. Those who've recently renewed their ISS subscription might feel they need it and get what they deserve. Um, first question, oh, well, on the questions, uh, I should just say that because we're recording this, um, I'm going to have to repeat your question. So there is an extra incentive to be, uh, to be brief and to the point. The first person who caught my eye is the gentleman in the corner, please. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Shaw. Uh, my question is, uh, Maliki has turned out to be a sheer leader, um, dependent on Iran, which dismays the Saudis, uh, drives a nail in the coffin of UN strategy of 2003, and renders futile the British attempt to do a deal uh, with an anti-Iranian in, in Basra in 2007. My first question is, was this inevitable? Should we have foreseen this? Uh, my second question is, so what? Does this mean that Maliki is rented by the Iranians, or is he bought by them as some sort of long-term strategic alliance? I think it would be easy to overstate Maliki's dependence on Iran. I think that dependence has become greater, certainly uh, since the start of the Arab Spring, when Iran has been calling in its, uh, its favors. It's certainly in terms of overflight rights between Iran and Syria, the re-equipping of, of the Syrian army uh, uh, by Iran has been heavily facilitated by what should we say, quiescent um, uh, uh, attitude of the Iraqi government and their sustained but not yet proven rumors that the Iraq's central bank and indeed uh, private banks in Iraq have been used for sanctions busting uh, for both Syria and, and um, Iran. So there is clearly a, a tilt of Baghdad towards Iran. The reason I wouldn't overstate it is firstly uh, because we know that Maliki wasn't Iran's choice for prime minister after the 2010 elections. That what Iran wants is a weak, uh, dependent leader. Why they swung all their weight behind um, Maliki, and it's quite fascinating if you look at Muqtada al-Sadr's website, Muqtada al-Sadr obviously furiously anti-Maliki, is then forced to join the coalition that backs Maliki for premiership. And he puts a, 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 an edict on his website saying to his followers, look, I'm really sorry, but you don't understand the pressure I'm under. And of course, the pressure he's under is not from his own followers and not from Iraqis, but from uh, the Iranian government. So they, ha they pushed forward very much um, in getting Maliki in power because they were petrified of the Iraqi vote and what that might mean for Iraq. Now, is this situation 
inevitable. An Iraqi politician, an Iraqi prime minister increasingly authoritarian and indeed increasingly aligned, if not totally de dependent on Iran. No, I don't think it was inevitable. In that, Maliki has striven to maximize his, his autonomy from both Washington and Tehran. But as, as you know more than me, one only has to look at the map, at that, that very long border between Iran and Iraq, and you could argue that um, Iran did have a day after strategy in 2003, where the United States didn't. And Iran and, and the, the, the key politicians that the United States empowered and placed in Baghdad, especially the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, was explicitly and obviously a vehicle for Iranian policy when they were founded during the Iranian Revolution. The fact that this escaped the United States, or the United States was pragmatic enough, especially under the Bush administration, to empower key politicians, I think is, speaks to a, a kind of larger cock-up uh, cock theory of politics, where you take over a country you don't fully understand, you're dealing with politicians you don't fully understand, and then you seek the least of, of all evils, which is a series of uh, Iranian-aligned politicians. Nigel, please. Um, you haven't mentioned the K-word, uh, and I was wondering if you could say something about uh, Kurdistan, uh, particularly given uh, the extent to which uh, the Kurdish regional government seems to be uh, making its own way in terms of letting oil contracts, exporting oil without uh, regard for the interests or wishes of the Iraqi central government. Uh, how do you see this relationship developing, and, and what are the implications regionally? All right, so the question uh, for, for the recording was, uh, what ways do we see the Kurdistan regional government going, given that it has uh, shown a measure of autonomy? Yeah, that you'll be happy to know there are two chapters that deal at great length with uh, Ibil uh, Baghdad relations. I think that, that there are two arguments there. The, the, the Kurdish regional government strategy has been transparent since 2003, and you could argue that the Kurds were, or should we say, I don't know what the metaphor was, making hay or had, had a, a wonderful time, from, roughly from about 2003 through to about 2000. Six seven, where the Iraqi constitution, large, almost totally drafted in uh, President Talibani's house, it bears the imprint of certain key advisors employed by the Kurdish regional government, and sought explicitly to make the Iraqi central state as weak as possible. And the Kurdish regional government, especially the KDP and the PUK, the two central Kurdish parties, wore out their welcome with wanton precision in Baghdad from 2003 through seeking to continually weaken the, Kurdish, the, the Iraqi state. Now, from 2007 onwards, this was clearly a losing battle. And as the Iraqi army became stronger and stronger, as Maliki managed to concentrate power in his own hands, and as the Iraqi became more coherent, you were seeing... Uh, a, a collision between Erbil and Baghdad. And this, I think, was probably <laughs> very predictable. Now, understandably, the Kurdish regional government has sought to do two things to minimize that risk. Firstly, they've continually sought to keep the government in Baghdad weak, and they failed at doing that. In key interviews for the book that I did with very senior Kurdish politicians running through till 2011, I said, you can remove this man if you choose to. You can rally a majority in the Iraqi uh, parliament and push through a vote of no confidence. Oh, we can't do that, we won't do that. It's only very late in the day that Mas Masoud Barzani, especially the head of the Kurdish, uh, Kurdistan Democratic Party, has sought to be at the core of a coalition to do that. And I think it's too late. I think they got their timing wrong. They thought the threat from Maliki was much less than the threat from a resurgent state on Iraq here. Uh, Barzani... Uh, brokered the November 2010 Erbil agreement, and he should have known then that, ironically, he was creating a rod for the back of the Kurdish regional government. Now, he's pushed and pushed. I was in uh, Washington when he was there, and, my God, he was shouting and screaming about the F-16s that the, the American government are, sending, are selling to Baghdad and saying they will be used against us. And in no uncertain terms, I have it on very reliable authority, that Biden told him to go home, shut up, and get on with renegotiating his relationship with Baghdad. So... I think that the, 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 the Kurds have sought to and have failed to constrain the power of Baghdad. And now, yes, you're, I think you're right, they're, they're moving towards a breakout strategy where in very close alliance with Ankara, and again, there's a, a long chapter on the reasons for Turkey's declining relations with uh, Iraq under the premiership of uh, um, uh, uh, Maliki. They're trying to break that up, but there, there are clear problems. Even on the best scenarios, 
Iraq, Kurdistan's own oil experts won't, won't deliver for many years what the, its 17% its uh, share of the Iraqi budget delivers to it. So there's an imbalance between what they say, what, you know, in, in, in export, independently exporting oil and what they're getting from the exchequer in Baghdad. And secondly, they haven't got the pipelines yet to do that. All the oil is trucked across the border at, at, a, at a discount. And finally, it's the great irony that the KDP is simultaneously increasingly dependent on the politics of Ankara while seeking to empower through direct advice and training, the, the, the uh, autonomous aspirations of the Kurds in Syria. I think that circle is not going to be squared, and I think, I, I assume, though I have no insight into this, Ankara will be perfectly happy to have a vassal buffer state run by the KDP if and until its autonomy threatens, uh, threatens to mobilize the Kurdish populations of Turkey. And so the Kurds are, are caught between Ankara and Baghdad, who until very recently had a united interest in minimizing the power of, of the Kurdish regional government and may well once again <coughs> reform that alliance. So it's not a particularly comfortable position for the Kurdish regional government to be in. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman at the back, grey jacket, please. If you'd stand up. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Okay, so the questions were, um, demonstrations tend to be um, Sunni, are there uh, examples of Shia demonstrations? And secondly, uh, what has happened to the Ba'ath Party? No, you're right. Uh, the, the demonstrations triggered by Asawi's arrest are focused on Ramadi, Fallujah, the Northwest. That's exactly right. And unsurprisingly, given that Asawi is such a powerful and popular politician in those areas. But if you go back to the start of the so-called Arab Spring, what you then saw were a series of very populist demonstrations starting in the south of the country, largely we would assume made up of Shia demonstrations in Basra, in the south, rolling up to Baghdad, the Baghdad Spring. Now Maliki sought to deal with that, which was a direct threat to his rule because it was from his electoral vote bank, as it were, the Shia of the south. Firstly, by declaring a kind of a, a white-hot reform of 100 days, saying that his cabinet ministers be sacked, so, uh, saying that he'd shrink his own wages, suspending the buying of these F-16s to put more money into the Iraqi ration packet, so to try and buy off that population. When that didn't work, he then unleashed coercion. The demonstrations in, uh, in the centre of Baghdad were repressed by plainclothes policemen, and then Maliki gave a speech where he called the demonstrators unpatriotic and representative of kind of sinister forces. And that links to your second question. As you know yourself, Maliki has repeatedly invoked the Ba'athist threat as a direct threat to post, the post-2003 political settlement as the sinister organisation haunting the future of Iraq. This is absolute rubbish. It's completely unsustainable. After 35 years of, rule, of corrupt, violent, deeply unpopular rule, the Ba'ath Party was shredded in 2003. They had very little popular legitimacy. They were a vehicle and a shrinking vehicle for Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. After regime change, they were driven into exile, gone underground, and they were broken. The idea that any reformed organization uh, mirroring the Ba'ath Party as a threat to any, to, 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 to the, the Iraqi politics, I think, beggars belief. Secondly, those who went into exile and remained politically active were based in Syria and were under the patronage of the, of the Syrian regime, which now has a lot more to worry about than empowering former Ba'athists in, um, in Iraq. And secondly, of course, you have the great irony that Maliki is now actively supporting the prolonged rule of Assad in Syria, the, 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 the previous support of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq. So I think the Ba'ath Party is a spent, broken force, has no legitimacy, and because of events in Iraq, in Syria has very little strategic depth or indeed financial or organizational capacity. Okay, uh, Dana Allen. Toby, um, among, I guess, your general conclusions at the end of your presentation, um, was the argument that, or at least the suggestion that 10 years after the invasion, it's hard to say that it was wise or worth it 
Um, that's not, at this point, a radical conclusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are quite a few people who would, would share that view. But I just wonder if, um, if you were, um, to, to say it wasn't worth it is to say that it is not the same thing as it saying it, it achieved nothing. And I just wonder if you meant to say, and meant to suggest mm -hmm. that the uh, corrupt, worrying authoritarianism of Maliki is comparable or is going to be comparable to the despotism of Saddam Hussein. Okay, so a question on the, um, um, the, the legacies of intervention and whether Toby thinks that ultimately uh, Maliki will prove to be as despotic as Saddam Hussein. Well, I suppose the honest answer would be who knows. Uh, the, the, the more complex answer would be that the Ba'ath Party, uh, Anna Hassan al-Bak and Saddam Hussein had 35 years to secure its grip on power and had ironically through, uh, through a series of reasons, through sanctions, through, through whatever, had developed a fairly um, effective uh, model of repression. So a lot of the great bloodletting, the violence, especially the horrors of uh, 1990, 91, were behind the regime and that had effectively pacified the population. What Maliki is doing is centralizing power um, is, has built up with American assistance, though not, I suppose, not, uh, um, a very powerful set of coercive institutions that can now effectively repress the population. Will it be as bad as Saddam Hussein? Who can tell? What I can look at is a man with clear dictatorial ambitions, a, 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 a mobilized and fairly wide ruling elite that will need either to be co-opted, exiled, or intimidated. And that's why what we've seen with Hashimi, we've seen with the sacking of Central Bank of Shabibi, and we've seen with the attack on Assal. We clearly, Maliki is moving through the elite, picking off those who are the most threat, threatening to him. That's very uh, violent and intimidating if, uh, if, you, um, if, if it's directed at you. Is the population mobilized enough to require the type of excessive repression and genocide unleashed by Saddam Hussein? No, not at the moment. But you have clearly mobilized, organized political forces, the most coherent, I would have thought, are the Sudderists, who are now set against Maliki and will have to be dealt with in, a, in an authoritarian way um, if Maliki's rule is to continue. So I think Maliki is faced with a series of <coughs> questions that any would-be dictator uh, needs to find answers to. That may well not result in the kind of industrial strength violence under Saddam, but it certainly looks as though democracy is under a sustained threat and the Iraqi state pumped up on oil wealth with a massively overdeveloped coercive capacity doesn't look like the outcome that anyone would have hoped for in 2003. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, questions, please. Uh, one of them is, as we see the civil war in, uh, in Syria not ending soon, and uh, Bashar has a stay, how do you see the spell over from Syria uh, on Iraq? Because so far they have managed to contain it. Also, the population in Iraq, the Shia population in Iraq, who have elected uh, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? What's his name? The, the, no, the other prime minister. Alawi. Alawi, yes, sorry about that. Uh, he he <coughs> clearly has a base. Uh, would these side with the Sunnis that are now demonstrating? Because, uh, as I understand, many people do not like the influence of Iran on mm. Iraq. Okay. Uh, two questions. Firstly, uh, can Iraq continue to um, be largely insula insulated from the spillover of the Syrian civil war, which there's no signs of ending? And secondly, um, might Alawi ally with, ally with uh, the Sunnis um, and as a part of a broader anti-Iranian coalition? I think that the, the Iraqi border with Syria uh, is, is almost unsealable, even with the full might of the surge troops um, in the northwest of Iraq, they had great difficulty controlling that border. I think, ironically, what we've seen is a reverse flow of battle-hardened fighters, weapons, and jihadis going across the border from Iraq into Syria. Now, Nouri gets back to the question on Iran. Now, Nouri al-Maliki's support for Assad's continued rule is partly based on a fear that what replaces Assad will be, a, in his view, a much more radical, much more problematic uh, sectarian Sunni regime, and then there will be a reverse flow once more, and those 
those fighters will come back across the border. I mean, uh, given that the Assad regime looks to have a good few more months or years in it le left, that is not an immediate scenario, and I think Iranian pressure is much more influential on, on uh, Iraqi backing and Iraq, Iraq's overt undermining of the sanctions on Syria. Um, so I, I think the spillover is, the, the, the potential spillover is great, but limited at the moment. Um, and, and the longer that dispute goes on, I suspect the more attempts to isolate the Syrian conflict from the wider region as Iraq, the Iraqi conflict and then did the Algerian conflict before it was isolated, or the Lebanese conflict to some extent was isolated, they will go forward. On the potential for a reach over, as it were, from what we could call the Iraqi spring forces of the south, Basra and Baghdad, and up to the forces demonstrating um, uh, in favor of Asawi. You know, I doubt it. I, I, pessimistically, uh, lots of us uh, wrote lots of very optimistic things about her, and some of us still do, about the potential for an Iraqi nationalism to mobilize and unite. But I suspect that was before the Iraqi civil war, and the civil war has indeed rendered apart uh, a palpable sense of Iraqi nationalism, which is the great tragedy of the Iraqi civil war. And indeed, although Iraqia and Alawi's stewardship of Iraqia fought very hard to deliver a platform of non-sectarian politics. Part of what the Abil Agreement in November 2010 was about was to say, no, 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 you've just taken over from the Iraqi Islamic Party and to Wafik, you're just the voice for, for Iraq's Sunni population. And to some extent, uh, Iraqi's politicians who aren't the most, uh, some of them aren't the most tactically astute in the world, bought into that and rebranded Iraqi as Sunni, and as soon as you do that, that vehicle for nationalist mobilization disappears. So clearly there has been an alliance between Barzani, Sada, and Alawi to try and remove um, Maliki, but it has been patently unsuccessful in getting the majority needed in the Iraqi parliament, and I suspect that's indicative of its larger inability to get a mass movement against Maliki in the next year or so. Mr. Svidlitsky, please. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the Iraqi army consists of 930,000 people. So the question is, who's arming this army? Where do they get the arms from? And is it from Moscow? Uh, a couple of months ago, the Russians said that they placed a big order in the Iraq, which was subsequently denied. So are the Russians getting ahead of themselves, or is something the matter? So a question about arms supplies, and I suppose ultimately influence over Iraq's near million man army. Um, no, that's on, yes, the, the, the Russian arms deal is fascinating for um, a series of, uh, of reasons, and indeed uh, for the people who were removed from Maliki's immediate entourage because of their alleged, we must state that uh, because it's not gone to court, complicity in the massive bribes that were meant to be linked to that deal. Um, and, well, and the figures are dizzying. Um, and indeed, uh, when I was interviewed uh, one of the uh, senior politicians allegedly linked to the deal, who rang up Moscow and said, um, did you make it public, what you'd offered us? And, uh, and they said, yes. Said, How can you do politics like that? So anyway, that's a, that's a sideline. If you talk to Washington, and, uh, and especially uh, the Pentagon, they will argue very clearly that their route to influencing the Iraqi government and Iraqi state formation is through their supplying of F-16s, of tanks, of, of the vast amounts of ordnance and kit that is indeed flowing <coughs> from American armament manufacturers into Iraq. The way I read uh, the, um, the, the Maliki's deal with Russia was, yeah, yeah, we'll take all your stuff from Washington because it's the most technically advanced. Our army has been trained and set up basically to reproduce uh, a force model uh, built in the United States, but we won't only take your weapons. We will indicate to you very clearly we can go to Russia, we can go to other weapon suppliers to limit your influence upon our army. And I think that's, that's clearly the case. I think the lessons of the transition in Egypt, where Mubarak's senior military figures were read the riot act by the United States, said, look at your military and imagine what it would look like without American direct aid, uh, were not lost in Baghdad, that uh, Maliki is seeking to diversify his source of arms. I don't think he'll need to do it a great deal, and I think the United States will be the main weapons supplier of, of Iraq for years to come. I see no 
extended worry about where Iraq's heading in Washington at the moment. Uh, so I don't, I don't foresee any armed sanctions or whatever. But um, Maliki very successfully indicated that with the amount of oil revenues it massively increasing coming into uh, the Iraqi budget, it, he can shop where he chooses for weapons. Uh, the, 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 the less publicized uh, aspects of the Russian arms deal aside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, David. Uh, gentleman at the back. There were negotiations going on between American government and Iraqi government following the surge about the future defense agreement. Uh, what has been the outcome of that, both in military and diplomatic terms? And second part is, was the United States complicit in Maliki actually acquiring greater and greater concentration of power, or what was the United States attitude? Okay, so the first question is, um, uh, what is the outcome of the uh, U.S.-Iraqi negotiation on their, the nature of their relationship after, after U.S. withdrawal? And um, um, secondly, I've forgotten it for a moment, was the uh, U.S. complicit in the rise of Maliki? What was its attitude towards that uh, process? Yeah, I think uh, the first question is a fascinating case study in the incoherence of the superpower. I happened to be in Baghdad in 2008 when the team of State Department lawyers arrived to negotiate the Status of Forces Agreement, which was meant to regulate uh, military relations between Baghdad and Washington. And they came with an incredibly bold, dare we say, quasi-imperial document that gave everything that any United States military figure would want, including complete control of Iraqi airspace up to some certain height. And it was rejected almost overnight and out of hand, that they completely misjudged Iraqi politics. Now, George Bush won, and it's often forgotten by our neoconservative friends in Washington that George Bush pushed the status of force in negotiations because he wanted to draw a line under Iraq before he left office and place US-Iraqi relations on a sustainable basis. And so the status of forces agreement signed, which moved American troops out of uh, Iraqi cities in 2009 and then completely out of the country in 2011, is a very unambiguous document. Hence the relatively small number of Amer American troops in Iraq today handfuls, the fact that the, Iraq, the American embassy, or still the largest in the world, is protected by security contractors. Um, right up until the winter of 2011, then uh, Secretary of Defense Gates and the United States would say, oh, no, no, we'll get a new status force agreement, which shows the lack of understanding of Iraqi politics on the ground. There was no way Maliki, or indeed any member of the Iraqi parliament, was going to vote for the uh, the uh, autonomy from Iraqi law that, that the American soldiers would have needed to stay. So now there is a tiny amount of American troops on the ground. There's still talk about um, larger numbers of trainers coming out. that they'll ever arrive. And Iraq, we can say unambiguously, is uh, independent from, Iraq, from American influence in, in that sense. Although still it's got the largest CIA station in the world, that, that, that's being cut by 30% and the embassy is being cut and embassy outs, outposts in Basra and Mosul aren't being built. So Iraq is clearly free of American, of American influence and we can see that in its granting of overflight <coughs> rights for Iran to Syria and the fact that the US can do precious little about it, which I think is the final the final indication of that. Now, undoubtedly, your second question is, is an excellent one, and I, I, I can't give you chapter and verse on the answer to that. Is it a sin of omission or commission? Commission? Did the United States build this massive overbearing army, give it to Maliki and say, oh, we don't know what's going to happen with that, we can guess, but we don't really care? Or was this an overt plan to create, what could we call it, a competitive authoritarianism, uh, an authoritarianism with the trappings of democracy? On basis, and on the basis of interviews of senior decision maker, American decision makers at the time, I would plump for a sin of omission, not commission. And if, I don't know, David Petraeus were in the audience, he'd leap up and say, what did you expect me to do? In the middle of a civil war in 2007-8, uh, public opinion in the United States was demanding a withdrawal, so we built as quickly as we could the biggest Iraqi army we could, and look what it's done. It's, it's stopped the civil war. A spin-off of that is it's created or is on its way to creating an authoritarian government. Given that in October 2007, 2,700 innocent Iraqis were murdered in the midst of the civil war, the outcome of a, an authoritarianism, although horrific, 
and certainly not what was planned, is not the worst outcome. Mm -hmm. Certainly in 2006, most of us were predicting Iraq's civil war would go on and on and resemble something like the horrors that are unfolding in Syria now. Uh, but I don't think, uh, and the, the numerous examples of American incoherence, if not incompetence, in their dealings with the Iraqi government, the idea that they had some hidden blueprint for the rise of an authoritarian government after they left gives too much coherence to their blueprints, whatever they were, unfolding from 2003 onwards. Thank you. With, uh, with apologies to the one, two, three, four people who, uh, who have yet to ask a question, I'm going to have to bring it to a close here. However, the advantage is you do get the chance to maybe ask you a question over a glass of wine. Um, for those who are ISS members, your book's copy should already be in the post if they're not yet in your hands. Um, for those that don't have a copy would like to buy one, uh, you can get it today. Uh, cash or credit card, I believe. Cut price, £10. If you want a press copy, that's available from Ellen Miller, who will be just waiting outside. Um, so all that remains for me is to bring this event to a close. So thank you for Toby, and then to the wine. Thank you.